Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Hi. <laughs> nice to see everybody. Um, today we have a very uh, distinguished uh, speaker. I know him for many, many years. Um, we finally started PhD together, I guess. And one day I was working in, uh, um, I think, University of Western Australia. And then I saw this Australian, uh, Malaysian in Australia. And that is Jay, Jay Menon. And we've become good friends since then. Uh, let me introduce Jay. Uh, Jay is uh, uh, from uh, Asian Development Bank. And um, he is an academic in, in real heart. Uh, I do not know why he joined ADB, but anyway, he's been there for many, many years, I think. Uh, he joined in 1999, uh, and he's now the lead economist uh, in the office of chief economist at the Asian Devel Development Bank in Manila. And uh, he has worked at several DAS, uh, and uh, from Indian DAS to regional economic monitoring and the Southeast Asian uh, department. And uh, one thing I can say about Jay, uh, although uh, he worked uh, in, at ADB, uh, most of the academics know him very well, and uh, he comes across as a very serious uh, uh, researcher and a serious thinker in terms of how Asia and ASEAN integration actually works. And uh, he has been contributing quite a bit of work uh, in this area. And uh, in addition, uh, I know Jay for many years, and he's very passionate about uh, Malaysia and Malaysian politics because he's a Malaysian in heart. Although he, he has lived in Australia for many, many years. Uh, he graduated from ANU, I think, yeah. Melbourne, that's right, Melbourne, sorry. Uh, because his supervisor is somebody I know very well, so, and he's from uh, ANU. Uh, he graduated from University of Melbourne, and he worked uh, as an academic at University of Melbourne, and uh, Victoria University, and also at Washington, American University in Washington, uh, before he moved to ADB. Um, and uh, he still holds an adjunct position at ANU, and also at the University of Nottingham. I think he's at the board, I think, uh, here, uh, at the uh, University of Nottingham Malaysian campus. And uh, he also serves at uh, several editorial boards, including uh, my journal, that is Asian Economic Journal, and uh, Journal of Asian Economy. And, uh, and he has uh, worked on integration issues, and he has published very well. And in, in ADB, um, other than the chief economist, uh, he is uh, as published as the chief economist. So uh, that's true. Uh, if you look at his profile, uh, the, the chief economist is normally appointed as an academic from outside. And Jay, within ADB, is one of the most uh, published uh, individuals, which I know uh, very well. And with that, uh, let me introduce Jay. Uh, and Jay will have different perspective, uh, given his academic uh, work and also uh, in ADB, uh, and also as a Malaysian with a deep uh, interest in politics, he will combine that to discuss uh, how the, the, the new government can deliver uh, in the new phase of uh, development that you are looking at. With that, let me call upon uh, Dr. Jay uh, to give the talk. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that very generous uh, introduction, Chandra. I almost feel like sitting down now. I uh, don't think I can live up to <laughs> that uh, very generous uh, description, but uh, it's very, very nice to be here uh, at Sunway. Thank you all uh, very much for sparing the time to be here. And uh, thanks to uh, Sunway Jeffrey Chia Institute for uh, having me here today. Um, as Chandri mentioned, um, uh, what I hope to do uh, today in 30 minutes or less is uh, to cover a few things here um, about um, um, where we are uh, in Malaysia following the dramatic events uh, with the unexpected change in government, uh, the introduction for the first time in its history of a new government, and to look at um, uh, what 
uh, are some of the uh, key economic challenges facing uh, the new government. Uh, I'm sure this is familiar to a lot of you, but let me go through it very quickly. Uh, then to look at um, uh, what I feel are some of the key reforms. There are a lot of changes um, that will be required, but let me just pick on a couple that I feel uh, a bit more uh, comfortable talking about, given my own previous research into the uh, topic. Uh, and then uh, I want to finish off by looking at uh, this uh, nagging issue of um, what can we really expect uh, in terms of change uh, from the new government, right? Here, I guess we need to um, uh, play off um, the uh, very great expectations that uh, people hold uh, from the change that has come about politically uh, versus the ground realities of uh, you know, uh, of uh, a very long-serving government, uh, the racial diversity of the country, and so forth. And what can we realistically expect in terms of changes uh, going forward? So those are things that I hope to cover. Um, uh, please feel free uh, to interrupt me if you have uh, points of clarification, if you have any uh, significant questions or objections, please wait to the question time. But if there's any minor issue, I'm happy for you to uh, stop me uh, anywhere along the line. Okay, so let me get going now um, and start off by uh, describing quickly s some of the many challenges. This is not a comprehensive list. This is uh, just a short list of what I think are some of the key challenges. Okay, the first one which I'm particularly keen on discussing is the uh, structural regression in the economy, or what uh, has been described by uh, Danny Roderick, uh, uh, a famous economist, a development economist, as uh, premature industrialization, right? And then uh, I want to look quickly at how we are doing with investment, both foreign and domestic, um, youth unemployment and creating good jobs for Malaysians. This is clearly the fundamental reason why, uh, you know, uh, we, we need government and we've changed government, right? If you cannot deal with unemployment and deliver good jobs, then government has failed, right? Uh, then I want to talk quickly about addressing all kinds of inequality and finally this issue about governance and strengthening institutions. Okay, now not all of these are exogenous. There are some endogenous issues here, you know, uh, arresting uh, premature deindustrialization is going to be required to deliver good jobs and so forth. So these are not all exogenous, but I think broadly these are the issues that are discussed uh, quite a bit these days among policy and academic circles. Okay, let me start with the first one, uh, what I call premature deindustrialization. Here, uh, this is the changes in the structure, broad structure of the economy that uh, have been taking place and has been happening uh, more recently. Now, um, if I can find this pointer here. If you look at this, um, uh, what's going on here, this is uh, manufacturing. And manufacturing has been declining in the 2000s. Its share in GDP, okay? And so has industry. Okay, industry includes construction and construction-related manufacturing. Okay, but anyway, they're both moving downwards, trading downwards. Services is growing, and agriculture down here in blue is uh, stable, right? As a share of GDP around thirty percent. Okay, this is after, of course, uh, it fell sharply from the early seventies. It's now stabilized. Okay, 
So um, services is the only sector that's growing, right? But we need to ask ourselves what kind of services is underlying these changes, right? As countries move from middle income to high income, we usually expect the share of services to rise, okay? And this is usually uh, associated with good paying jobs in the finance sector, in the hospitality sector. Um, but is this really the case here? Um, if you uh, if you remember Dr. Mahate before the elections, he was of course saying that a lot of the jobs were grab drivers and nasi lemak vendors, right? These are all services, but it's not the kind of services that we want. So services, growing services, doesn't always mean a good thing, right? You need to look carefully at the components uh, of services that is uh, actually increasing. Now, um, in terms of uh, manufacturing, uh, again, we have to look within that group to see what's going on, right? Remember, manufacturing is falling as a share of GDP, but within manufacturing, there are also changes taking place. Uh, the last comprehensive manufacturing survey in 2012 uh, showed that uh, electronics is no longer the largest component of manufacturing, right? Instead, now we have petroleum refining at 19% and oil palm processing as 12% of manufacturing dominating electronics, okay? Uh, now, what's wrong with this? Well, the jobs in these sectors are few, and not very high paying, right? These are capital intensive sectors and the types of jobs that they generate are not really high paying jobs. So that is a concern we need to consider in this structural change. Of course, even within manufacturing, um, not all jobs are high paying, right? And there's a lot of foreign workers involved in manufacturing. So just simply going back to electronics, is not the answer either. It's about upgrading within electronics. But there's not much room for upgrading within oil refining or palm oil processing, right? But electronics has the potential, at least, to create better paying jobs as long as we can upgrade. Uh, upgrading, however, has been limited for various reasons. Okay. So, um, that's the structural changes taking place. Uh, now, trade as a share of GDP has also been falling since about the Asian financial crisis of 1997, right? I think you can see it up there, yeah. And this is true for both exports and imports, right? Uh, as a share of GDP, they have been falling. There's a little bit of an uptick more recently uh, up here, but that's only because world trade stopped falling, right? So there's a bit of an improvement. But uh, Malaysia is still a very open economy, but the importance of trade has been falling. Right. And uh, again, within its exports as well, uh, you can see that manufacturers up here is still the biggest share, right? But again, it's been trending kind of downwards. Bit of a pickup, but trending downwards. But again, this is, uh, the types of manufacturers uh, now is a lot to do with commodity processing, right? Either oil or palm oil. And then you've got the ores and the other exports here, uh, low but uh, stabilizing. OK, so that's the story with the structure. Uh, let me move on now quickly to investment. Um, foreign investment, FDI, has never really recovered since the Asian financial crisis. Remember, Malaysia was able to transform its economy from an agrarian to a manufacturing one in one decade, in one generation, just three decades, largely through foreign investment, right? But all that changed after the Asian financial crisis, and it never really recovered, right? Um, 
and it's been a net exporter of capital um, since about 2005. Okay, so you can see here um, in blue is foreign investment, right? And this is the peak of the uh, leading up to the Asian financial crisis, 97, 98, the big drop. And then it's been up and down, but it's never really gone back to anywhere near where it used to be, right? And then in about 2006, uh, outflows, the brown line of capital, exceeded inflows, right? And many people uh, ascribe this to capital flight, right? Not just uh, outward investment by GLCs or other firms. Um, and uh, so this is not necessarily a good thing. If it's outward investment, uh, it could be a good thing, but capital flight is never a, a good thing, right? But it's slumped lately, uh, and it'll be interesting to study why that has happened. Uh, I don't know why. I mean, there are people who think this is because investment overall is falling. Uh, there's no uh, investment to even uh, export, right? And others think, you know, it might just be there's no more capital to fly out. Uh, most of it has already fled, right? So, but we do need to have a proper study into these issues to get at the right answer. Right. Now, how about domestic investment? Okay. Again, if you go back to the Asian financial crisis, you can see that it was quite high at about uh, uh, above 40 percent. Okay. Then the big drop and no real recovery, right? A bit of a recovery here, right, in the uh, last few years, but nowhere near what it used to be, right? And here we have uh, investment uh, separated into public and private, okay? Um, again, the big change is the Asian financial crisis, um, 1997 up here, the big drop, um, and um, lately, we have seen a bit of an increase in the blue line, right, which is a private investment, compared to the brown, which is the public, right? Um, again, overall, the investment levels are low, lower compared to before the Asian financial crisis, but it's promising that there seems to be a bit of a recovery uh, gradually in private investment. Again, uh, we need to look carefully into what is driving this recovery, right? Uh, is it because Malaysia is becoming a more attractive investment site um, uh, for local firms? Or is it the GLCs themselves who are now doing more investment, right? Um, investment by GLCs are not considered public investment, right? They're still considered private. So uh, some people would argue that um, you know, uh, the transformation program has reduced uh, GLC crowding out private investment, but then this might just be GLCs increasing their investment instead of pure private firms coming back and investing again. Um, once more, the data is limited in terms of the detailed uh, investment information. Uh, so we need to have that data and hopefully this new government will be more forthcoming with that kind of information to properly study and understand what's going on uh, with uh, these investment numbers. Okay, let me move on now uh, to talk about uh, I think an important issue for many of uh, you younger people here, uh, youth unemployment. Um, this is one aspect of being an uh, advanced country that we already have, right? High youth unemployment. Uh, this is usually a problem for rich countries, as in, in uh, you know, um, first world, highly industrialized countries. But Malaysia has got high youth unemployment before becoming a high income country, and it's something that needs to be addressed. Uh, it's three times average unemployment at 10%. Um, and, you know, it could be even higher, actually, if you take into account discouraged workers and so on. Um, and 25% of graduates um, 
uh, remain unemployed six months after graduating, right? Which is an obvious concern. Um, and this is particularly high amongst the Bhumiputra, right? Um, coming out of many of the Mara colleges and so on. Um, now, despite uh, all of this, employers regularly complain in all kinds of surveys about difficulties in finding talent, right? Uh, so this uh, contradiction, right, finds an explanation in an obvious skills mismatch, right? And that skills mismatch, I think, can be traced back to uh, a broken education system, for want of a better term. Uh, not completely, uh, but in many ways there is a need to look at the whole education system, how it's run, um, and the distortions and the quotas, and how we can improve upon it. Uh, people often uh, see Malaysia, uh, both from inside and outside, as a net importer of labor, which it is, but people sometimes forget that it is a net exporter of skills, which is less difficult to see, right? But true all the same. Oops, oh gosh, this went a bit, this kind of got stuck. <laughs> I have to go fast, but not that fast. <laughs> okay, right. Right, uh, inequality next. Um, the government numbers suggest that um, income inequality measured by the Gini is falling, right? Um, in fact, it's fallen now below that so-called critical level of 0.4 in the latest estimate, but it's still high, right? Um, some people also question these estimates, but, you know, let's not get into that. But uh, it's also high, even if it's true that it's fallen, and it's still uneven across the different racial communities, right? So um, that's income inequality, but there are many other uh, measures of inequality that are clearly rising. Mumi, only 3.5 Here, yes. So um, these are official numbers from EPU, right? Uh, yes, it seems that in 2016, uh, the highest inequality was amongst uh, the Chinese community. That's right. And um, the lowest was Indian, but almost the same as Bumi. It, yeah. It used to be quite high amongst the Bumis. Um, if you go back to 2004, right, it was uh, just slightly, it was only uh, lower than uh, line line, which is actually badly measured. Um, but these are all the indigenous groups and so on, uh, where it's, you know, uh, these are small numbers and there are some people on very low incomes in uh, very rural areas. And then you get a few that are actually, you know, government ministers. So the gaps are very high, right? Yeah. But yeah, so according to these official numbers, the um, uh, in, uh, income inequality, right, within uh, the Bumiputra community has been falling. Yeah. And, but the point here, I think, there's two points I'd like to make. One is that they're still high, right, relatively speaking. Yeah, numbers at four, uh, point 0.4 or close to point 0.4 is considered high inequality, right? And this is just income. This is the trap. Uh, this intra-ethnic. Inter-ethnic. Uh, okay, that's that, those data are not here, right? But they have been narrowing, right? Um, the uh, I don't have the numbers for you, but from what um, I have read, they seem to be narrowing, right? Uh, of course, the big differences were between. Uh, Bumi and non Bumi, and those differences have been narrowing. Well, that's a very interesting uh, kind of comparison. Yeah. Which is a great interest. Sure. Yes. Um, and next briefing. 
<laughs> right, <laughs> the next briefing, yeah. Oh, I'm sure there will be people who study income inequality in the audience more than me. But uh, yeah, the question is, I'll come back to that issue actually, which is an interesting issue, is um, wouldn't you expect it given the huge uh, program of redistribution, right? Uh, you would expect some narrowing. Uh, the real question is, has it been worth it? Right? Has, be, has this program been the right way to go about narrowing it? At what cost? We can come back to that. Yes, here, I, I, I don't expect you to be able to read everything here, right? But uh, the point to be made here is that mean and medians are very different animals, right? Um, the median is always so much lower than the mean, right? So. Median being majority, mean being average, right? Uh, you can see here that, uh, well, half of Malaysians earn less than 2,000 ringgit a month, okay? And, um, and this varies across states, right? In some states, like Slango and so on, it's quite high, right? Up to 3,250. But in others, it can be 1,500 or lower. The, the majority of people in those countries are earning 1,500 ringgit or lower every month, right? Which is not a very good wage, okay? And uh, only one third of uh, wage earners have tertiary education in Malaysia, and of them, more than 50% are women, right? Which is perhaps not surprising, uh, and maybe a good thing. But here again, Dr. J. Yeah. Not now, later on, sure. or in the future. You're able to say, well, look, this is bad. But how bad? Yeah. In ADD region Right. Sure. Then sure. Then you get a better perspective. That's right. Okay. Yes. Okay. We can come back to that uh, towards the end, I think. Yeah. But those are very important issues, I agree. Yeah. This is for which year? Which year? Uh, this one is for 2016, <coughs> if I'm not wrong. Yeah. That's right. right, let me move on now. Uh, the other issue I want to talk about now is rising debt. This has been a lot in the media lately, especially when uh, the uh, new finance minister announced that it was one trillion ringgit and not, uh, not the 686, which is the government number that was being used, right? So what's the difference? Well, the difference are these two things, right? These are the so-called off-balance sheet items, right? Government guarantees of 200 uh, billion, almost, and uh, but the same in putting uh, public-private partnership lease payments, right? Now, um, some people will argue that um, you know we there are clear standards on how debt is measured, right? And this is what um, you know Moody's and all the rating agencies use, and we should stick to those standards. And I, I agree with that. But then the point I think that uh, is being made uh, by the new government is that there's been creative accounting, right? You are moving things uh, by uh, creative means to not appear on the books. Um, and thereby underestimating what is actually debt, what even the traditional measures would call debt, right? When you start doing that, then you are misleading yourselves by mis trying to, uh, you know, report lower debt levels. So this is the whole issue about what should be on and off balance sheets. But this is where the two numbers come from, and. Um, um, uh, and this is why I think I tend to agree with this government that they should be including all of these items to get uh, much yeah, better. I'm not uh, being a nuisance. No, no. I'm just, Good. <laughs> uh, I'm just correcting some, sure. maybe some misconception. Right. These figures are available in Bank Negara yes. and uh, economic reports. Sure. But it's a press that highlights the wrong thing. Yeah. So the government, I don't think, has been dishonest. Right. But the other point I think is you see. They have one trillion, two trillion. Yeah. But you usually look at it as a proportion of the GDP. Yeah, sure. And by World Bank standards, IMF standards, sure. rating agency, it's only 5.2. 5 .2. Right. I think you're right, absolutely. Um, so, uh, why yeah. do we play on this one? 
Sure. And this uh, is for political reasons. Right, okay. So I think there's two points there, right? Uh, the first one is uh, whether or not this was hidden. You're right, it was never hidden. Uh, it was always there. Uh, the difference is, uh, I think this government is saying, uh, because of the way in which um, things like uh, SPV, special purpose vehicles, and so on, were being used, that maybe we should be including these numbers in debt, right? So the, not saying that the previous government hid it, right? But the new government saying, uh, I think we should now include them to get a better idea. Uh, of what it is that uh, true obligations are if there's been some reconfiguration of previous obligations, right, by design, right? This is like this whole issue to do with the debts of the GLCs as well, right? The non-public, uh, non-financial public corporations issue. The EBT or the DEATH of the GLC? Uh, debt, not debt. <laughs> Yes, that's right. Debt can lead to death, but we're still talking about debt. Yeah. <laughs> okay, right. Uh, and then finally, of course, uh, let me just quickly get through this, um, you know, this whole issue of governance and uh, improving our institutions. Uh, you know, if you hear, if you read, um, you know, uh, why nations fail, you know, Asimoglu's uh, uh, Piece, then you know that he thinks that it's all about institutions, right? And how they are strengthened and what role they play. Um, and I think this government has recognized that, um, uh, trying to now reverse the degradation of various institutions, uh, the judiciary, uh, the police, the press, even the anti-corruption agency. And so I think this has to go hand in hand in delivering systemic change. Again, this is not to say that this didn't happen under previous administrations, but whatever the history, it seems now that this is now uh, a focus of the government and they're looking to try and improve it. And I think that's the important thing, right? But I think an important issue here also um, is how the bureaucracy will have to play a very important role. Right? Um, you cannot blame a bureaucracy that's only known one master for 61 years, right? And now um, you have a new, uh, you know, government in place. But this, uh, any kind of uh, reforms will require uh, strong support from the bureaucracy if it's to matter on the ground and implement it effectively. And this is something uh, also uh, that remains as a challenge. Now, this, that's a whole list of, uh, not a complete list, but a short list of challenges facing the government. I can't go through all of them. There are more of them also. But um, to meet those challenges, I think there are many factors that have to be overcome, right? Um, I can't go through all the factors in the time given. So I've picked just two issues, right, to focus on for the rest of my presentation. Um, and one is a specific one, and the other is a bit more general, uh, but they're both interrelated, right? The specific issue I'd like to talk about is GLCs and what we uh, need to do about them. Uh, I've picked this also because it's very much in the policy discussions right now. Um, every day when I read the papers online, I see some item about this, right? Um, and the more general one relates to the role that meritocracy should play going forward, right? The whole system of incentives and uh, discrimination, okay? Uh, now, they are linked, these two issues are linked because of the role that is given to uh, GLCs, specifically in the Affirmative Action Program. Right? Uh, and I'll come back to that a bit later. So um, dealing with them will require, uh, uh, dealing with these two issues, I think will be required to address uh, many of the challenges. So um, when I wrote a paper for ideas last year on GLCs, um, Tantri um, Abdul uh, uh, 
Abdul Wahid Omar, who's the head of PNB, uh, didn't fully agree with what I had to say. And uh, he, in fact, didn't seem to like the point that GLCs were leading to greater disparities or crowding out um, private investment or uh, leading to poor governance, right? And this was a while back. Uh, Tantri uh, Abdul Wahid is a very capable man that I've met several times. But of course, he's also the head of PNB, and, but not for much longer, apparently, he's stepping down. Uh, but I think these are issues that have been out there um, and uh, have been discussed for a while and are now coming back with the new government to be taken uh, more seriously. Okay. Uh, and this started actually just before the elections, if you remember, with uh, Tun Mahate, Dr. Mahate um, uh, claiming GLCs were monsters, right? This is a term that's been now uh, used a lot because uh, it is such an unusual thing to describe, <laughs> you know, uh, these firms as monsters. He said they are so big and huge and rich, and also that they have lost the original function, right? Uh, what they've designed to do. And after the elections, of course, um, a lot of evidence started spilling out about, uh, you know, various uh, GLCs and GLICs, the investment arms, right? Um, and we have seen now reports how uh, Bank Nagara and Kazana were being used to service uh, the debts of the 1MDB, right, through undervaluation of land sales and the like. Uh, this has all been coming out since then. Uh, so what do we, what should we do about GLCs and GLICs? Um, for GLICs, um, I think, um, you know, uh, others who have studied this a lot more than me, uh, like uh, Professor Terence Gomez and even uh, uh, Professor Jomo, who's now on the Eminent Persons uh, Advisory Committee, right? Uh, people who have studied this carefully have suggested a number of things. Uh, one is, uh, the first thing actually is to uh, give them institutional autonomy, right? To get them out of the Ministry of Finance, right? Which has been the problem uh, and which has accounted for all the manipulation, apparently, that's been possible in the past, right? Um, so, and that's happening uh, already with this new government, right? But also, they call for an independent body with uh, uh, operational oversight, right? And uh, finally, internal managerial reforms, okay? Right. But um, uh, this is particularly important for GLICs because unlike most of the big GLCs, they are not publicly listed, so they're not, uh, they don't face the same level of scrutiny, okay? Um, but GLCs, it's a bit more difficult, right? Um, the answer is not as straightforward, uh, but it's useful to go back and think uh, about what they were originally uh, designed for. Right? What were they originally? I mean, Dr. Mahate says they've lost the original function. What was that function? Right? Um, now, it was very clear that GLCs were almost uniquely in this country um, uh, tasked to help with the Bumiputra program, right? To f first create, uh, to create a new class of Bumiputra entrepreneurs in two ways, right? First, through the GLCs themselves, and then, secondly, through a process of divestment, okay? Um, now, um, have this having happened and gone on for years, looking back now, we can see that uh, there has been successes, there have been Bumiputra entrepreneurs uh, that have emerged, um, and there have been uh, re reductions in income inequality between the races, right? There's no doubt about that. There's also been a reduction in wealth inequality to some extent, right? When in 1970, when the NEP started, 
uh, I think Bumiputra has owned two percent of um, uh, wealth, right? Uh, by the time, uh, by 1990, 20 years, which was supposed to be the, uh, the lifetime of the NEP, uh, it had gone up to about 17 percent, okay? It didn't reach the 30 percent target that they had aimed for, but it had increased dramatically, okay? Increased from a low base, right? Sorry, that's a technicality. Yeah. Definition. Sorry. If you take GLC, the private sector, so if you take that into account, it's much larger than 20% as indicated in the plan. Um, okay, no, no, the, you mean... I'm just raising a technical point. Right, no, no, but I just wondering what the point is. Okay, no, the 20% is, no, the 17% you mean? They are really 19%, 20%. Right, okay. Uh, but that's not just from the GLC, that's just wealth ownership, right? But share, corporate share of the economy, right. I think should include GLC, which right. play a private sector role in sure. the public sector. Right, okay. No, no, I agree with that. Yeah. So if you make that adjustment, it's mm -hmm. much higher. It could well be exceeding 20% up to 30%. Okay. Now. Now, right, okay. Which. Well, Which is a controversial issue, but I'm okay. raising with you from the ADB side. <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right. Your pick up <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I better not say anything as from ADB side. Uh, talking personally here, oh, I might get into trouble when I get back. But <laughs> Okay, even if it's 20 or 30 percent, I think you might agree that the amounts involved, right, the financial money amounts involved in uh, the program itself, and the kind of uh, distortions introduced, right, across the board in so many different areas, right, uh, did not justify the changes that we saw, right? Um, now, that's a judgment, okay? We can uh, disagree about it, but I think most people will agree that given the amounts involved and given the cost to the economy through the dead weight losses and inefficiencies created, that more should have happened or there might have been better ways of doing it, or there was something wrong with the way in which the system ended up being implemented, right? Yeah. I think if I, I may just suggest yeah. constructively, I hope, mm -hmm. the second line, introduce benefits to some learned point. Right? <laughs> uh, because some Bumi Putras gain tremendously from this. Uh, which <laughs> line are we talking about? Sorry. Okay, well, I'm just raising the point of. <laughs> oh, but you haven't read my third point. What does that tell you? The benefits of Bumiputra were unjustifiably small and unequally distributed. Yeah, but the emphasis is there were, this created a lot of cronies. What does unequally distributed imply? Well, very big. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, well. <laughs> If you want uh, something that's not vague, then how about this? First line. I think that reduces the vagueness. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> yes. Um, like I said, I'm not talking as ADB here, right? Yeah, this is a personal <laughs> view. But um, I think they were the wrong instrument. And as you, as you correctly say, I think, right? It led to crony capitalism, state dependence, regulatory capture and corruption, right? Yeah, these, are, these, yeah, these are the things that this type of instrument was the wrong instrument, right? Uh, to try and achieve this kind of outcome, right? Yeah, on top of that, um, there is now empirical evidence that a colleague in, of mine, uh, Bernard Ng, uh, at ADB and I have produced uh, using very detailed firm level data that actually shows that there is crowding out of private investment, right? So in sectors where GLCs are dominant, private investment is negatively affected, and where they're not, there's a positive impact. So it cuts both ways, right? Again, no empirical evidence is perfect, but there is evidence out there to suggest this concern about crowding out may be justified, right? And even the government has been worried about this for a long time. They raised it in the new economic model 
going back to uh, 2011. So, what should we do? I think the first point to recognize is that uh, there, there's, there are good and bad GLCs. Not all GLCs are bad, not all of them are, are good, right? Um, if they're not crowding out private investment, if they operate efficiently, if they perform a social function as they're designed to do, then there's no need to really consider divestment, right? But uh, if, on the other hand, they crowd out private in investment and um, there are no, there's no public or social function that's clear about uh, their activities, and if they're inefficiently run or making losses, then uh, we should uh, look at that more carefully and wonder why we are why government is involved in this way in the market okay um, but we need to be careful here in measuring performance right um, sometimes great performance comes from special treatment right and a lot of GLCs are accused of having special treatment from government special access to loans, etc., uh, etc. Et okay? Uh, people often say, oh, where's your evidence, right? People cannot always give you evidence for everything, right? Corruption is hard to actually prove many times. Uh, in the same way that, you know, we didn't have evidence that the earth was round for a long time, but uh, it is. Yeah, there was anecdotal evidence, ships were not falling off the edge, uh, but hard evidence for many of these things don't exist. Uh, some of, there is some hard evidence. There are procurement rules that benefit uh, public uh, GLCs, right? Um, anyway, one needs to take that into account in measuring performance, I think. But also, uh, divestment uh, uh, is not always the answer, but when you want to pursue it, I think we have to be very careful as well, right? Uh, we have to make sure that um, the public assets are disposed at far mac, uh, market value, that there's no fire sale, right, of uh, public assets, and also that it doesn't um, concentrate market power or wealth in the hands of a few, right? And, um, you know, I mean, I think you all know this, this is alleged to have happened before, right, with, um, uh, uh, there was a Wall Street Journal article as well recently that uh, highlighted all of these things in the context of what this new government, especially since Dr. Mahate is in charge again, right? This happened a lot apparently under his previous administration uh, with, uh, you know, uh, certain uh, closely connected uh, people benefiting greatly from privatization uh, schemes and therefore questioning the value of this whole program of uh, divestment. And that needs to be carefully guarded against uh, from happening again. Right. But we should ask the question also, if you look at different sectors, right, what is, uh, why is government so heavily involved in like construction or media or property development, right? High-end luxury property development with special uh, you know, uh, way, uh, waivers on uh, on a uh, number of um, buildings that can be built, etc., leading to gluts as well, right? So these are sorts of things that should be looked at. Um, and also, um, uh, you know, despite all of this and despite having monopoly power sometimes, why are some of them making losses, right? Yeah. So these are the issues that need to be considered. Um, in, in um, deciding uh, what to do about GLCs. But uh, they are just general items uh, that I am highlighting here. Uh, there is still a need to have a very detailed study of the GLCs and not just the big ones that we always hear about, right? There are thousands of GLCs that we never hear about. Uh, many of them are at the state level, right? Uh, and they need to be looked at as well. In fact, that is, I think, the ticking time bomb uh, with the state development boards and the state GLCs that don't get 
discussed very much um, either in the media or among uh, the policy circles and the academic circles, uh, the state level uh, GLCs. Now, um, I'm aware of time, but I've been interrupted a few times, right? <laughs> no, but good interruptions, but I'm just claiming a bit more time. Uh, but uh, if you give me another 10 minutes, I'll try and wrap it up. Um, um, okay. So uh, that's, uh, uh, that's the issue uh, of uh, the specific issue of GLCs that I wanted to talk about. And of course, this relates more broadly to um, the general issue of the whole incentive and policy environment in the country, right? And um, uh, so this also links to what kind of mandate does this new government have? Right, uh, did, well, because they're a coalition government uh, of varied parties. Right, okay. Some things are non-controversial. Everyone will agree we need to reduce corruption, improve the rule of law. Uh, you know, all those sorts of things are fine. Right, but the elephant in the room, of course, is uh, race-based policies. Right, that have been a feature of uh, the social, political, and economic landscape in this country from uh, uh, 1970 at least, right, with the NEP, right? But if you go back to the NEP itself, right, uh, and look at it carefully, the two tenets were, one, poverty eradication regardless of race, and two, a restructuring of society to eliminate the identification of race with economic function, right? This is right there in the NEP document uh, itself. Okay, now at that time, uh, I guess the point here is that, um, you know, there was no uh, means testing, right? So uh, uh, if, um, the Bumiputra policy, when it was first introduced, uh, spoke of race, but not socioeconomic status, right? So uh, that, I think, is a fundamental f failing of any affirmative action program, right? It doesn't have to be the Bumiputra program, but if you look at uh, affirmative action programs around the world, right? Socioeconomic status is a key determinant for recipients, right? And that was missing. But I think the reason it was missing was because at that time, it didn't seem to matter much, right? Um, poverty was at about 52%, 49% in Peninsula Malaysia, right? And uh, most of the poor were rural Malay farmers. There were pockets of poverty amongst in the Indian and Chinese communities in uh, the rubber estates and the tin mine workers, but most of them were still rural Malay farmers. So you didn't have to bother with means testing. It was kind of redundant. But that was then, right? And it never came back in, right? And that, I think, was clearly a failing of the way the system was implemented, designed and implemented, the lack of uh, means testing, right? Yeah, and this is why I think, um, you know, uh, it also was supposed to kind of have a, you know, uh, a lifetime, right? 20 years. But after 20 years, they said the targets weren't met, so it just went on and on and became more widespread and more entrenched. And I think um, uh, the target audience, the Bumiputras, didn't see much benefit but a very small minority enjoyed super benefits, right? And that was the problem. Okay, so uh, this is a quote about the NEP, uh, and I wonder if anyone can guess uh, which critic might have said this about the NEP, right? Um, you know, could have been Professor Wing Tai Wu, since he's not here, I can mention that. <laughs> Was it Professor Jomo or Professor Gomez? Okay, what does it say? It says, unfortunately, the protection and privileges accorded by the NEP may weaken the Malays further by lulling the next generation into complacency, 
thinking that the NEP's affirmative action will always be there for them. Uh, the NEP has become like crutches, which, when used too long, results in atrophy of the muscles. Uh, they can make the user so dependent that their inherent capability regresses. Would anyone like to guess who said this? Like mother in his more yes. rational mood. <laughs> 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 Yes, you're both right. But I'm not too sure about rational mood. I think <laughs> this is rational, this is true. But this is also post government, right? In his memoirs, right? Uh, doctor in the house. So it's with hindsight and with no longer being in government, you can see things so much more clearly, obviously, right? And so, um, uh, yeah. So that's what he had to say. Uh, after leaving government, reflecting in his memoirs, right? But I think the point um, I'd like to make here is, um, okay, building on his point. So his point is that there was no proper uh, incentives, right? Uh, it was provided irrespective of socioeconomic status. The richest Malay and the poorest Malay had the same access, and it was ridiculous, right? And um, uh, like a friend of mine, who is a very successful uh, Malay academic, says he feels like a second-class citizen in Malaysia, right? Because of this program, people often, non-Malays often complain of being second-class citizens in Malaysia because of this program. But as a Malay, he feels he's also treated as a second-class citizen because this program is there in perpetuity to apparently help a race that cannot survive without help. That's how he sees it, right? Uh, and so he too sees it as unfair, but in a very different kind of way, right? So I think uh, Dr. Mahate's point is that, uh, you know, it can lead to uh, dependency and uh, complacency, and, um, and so it becomes self-defeating, right? Uh, the results we expect uh, are never realized because of that self-defeating nature of the way the program is implemented, right? Okay, so, but in changing the program, if we should, right, I think uh, the, uh, the discussion gets uh, heated or sensitive or uh, difficult when, because people automatically think of it as a binary choice, right? Uh, whether we have it or completely overhaul it. I don't think uh, that's the way to look at it, right? There is no pure system of meritocracy anywhere in the world, right? Uh, you can't find it anywhere. Uh, people say Singapore has a meritocratic system. Uh, it's not perfect, right? Um, and there are uh, failings of it there too, right? Um, if it was purely meritocratic, you wouldn't have the wife of the prime minister in charge of the biggest wealth fund. Right, unless she's super talented, <laughs> but, uh, by coincidence, yeah, by super coincidence also, right? So every country has its difficulties, and there's no perfect system, right? Um, but and in Malaysia more so, because of the multiracial society, we need to strike a balance, right? We cannot aim for a complete reversal, but the issue now is not that uh, is that it's gone too far the other way. Right for too long, because of regulatory capture as well, right? Uh, and the system has become too unwieldy in the wrong direction. And actually it requires rebalancing. And it also requires rebalancing because it's unsuccessful. It hasn't served its objectives, right? It's unfair to both boomies and non-boomies. If you remember the quote from my friend who feels uh, as a second-class citizen by being Malay and by having this program, and it's also unsustainable, right? You cannot keep squeezing 30% or a dropping minority to subsidize a majority forever, right? Um, you can appear to do so by transferring the cost to the next generation, right, which is what is happening. Right? It's an intergenerational transfer that's taking place to fund this tax subsidy system, uh, which is not 
very transparent, but very real, right? Future generations will have to pay the cost um, of this system. So it's not really a choice any longer, right? If it's not sustainable, right? It needs to be fixed. But I think the way to also do it is not to um, think of it purely in racial terms, right? Um, the issue here is about patronage, right? And cronyism, okay? Um, for instance, let me read this out. If a race-based quota results in the most politically connected rather than the most talented within that community, right? Say within that Bumiputra community, getting the top posts, then costs are maximized and benefits are minimized. So it's not that uh, the Bumiputra quota is producing um, the best Bumiputras for the right jobs. It's the best connected Bumiputras, right? And sometimes it's just the best connected who might not even be Bumiputra, right? Yeah. Either way, it is costly and uh, it uh, is inefficient, okay? So the change is first and foremost to patronage politics and then worry about the rest, okay? It, and like I said, uh, patronage politics is colorblind, right? It can occur across all races, especially at the level of the so-called elites, right? Um, so uh, I think this should be the first step. And once the benefits of this reform become evident, uh, it can then move into the next step of dealing with this long-standing system of uh, racial preferences, right? And the benefits from uh, the efficiency gains can be used to, in a targeted way, to mitigate the adjustment costs for the uh, changes to the system. Because there will be adjustment costs and it will take uh, some time and there should be compensations as we move forward. And the uh, last point on this issue I want to make is that at, in the long run, right, once the system is reformed, right, the majority of the beneficiaries, quite paradoxically, in my view, will be the Malays anyway, right? Because they're the majority of the population, right? The system is now failing them, right? It's not producing the kind of uh, 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 targeted intentions uh, it was designed to produce. Uh, so uh, the main beneficiaries, in the long run, if they can uh, if we can survive through the adjustment costs in the short to medium run, then in the long run, the main beneficiaries will be the people uh, who are in the majority, which are the Malays. And paradoxically, removing the Bumiputra program may actually end up benefiting more Bumiputras than anyone else, right? Uh, but there's always someone who has to pay the price, and I think the price will be paid by a very small minority of patrons and cronies, right? They will be the losers, right? And they can come from all races, uh, as uh, I think we have seen already, as we know. Okay. Uh, right, so Dr. Mahate earlier on had uh, an interesting view in his memoir, but more recently now, and he's prime minister in this context, uh, this is what he had to say when he was in Singapore, actually. Well, that was just earlier this month. So he said, um, slowly, uh, we need to slowly forget the racial origins and think of uh, themselves Malays uh, as pure Malaysians, right? So this is his current position as prime minister, OK? Um, OK, so this is the talk, right? Yeah. So uh, can the government lead the way in moving in this direction uh, which the Prime Minister has articulated? I think it can, but it has to be effective as a coalition, right? And have the required strong leadership. And this is the last point I'm going to make, okay? 
uh, I think uh, to be realistic, we have to recognize that um, uh, this coalition and its coexistence is based on convenience, right? Uh, the main bond between uh, all of these parties in the coalition government, uh, maybe uh, the only bond, real bond, is that they opposed Barisan for different reasons, right? That's what brought them together to fight this election. They may have common ideas across each of the parties, and uh, in fact, I hope they do, but this was what brought them together for this purpose, right? To topple, uh, you know, what appeared like the untoppable <laughs> government, right? For so long. And this is uh, uh, the real challenge, I think, facing this government, which is governing as a coalition. Uh, there's great diversity across parties um, in the coalition. Um, race and religion play different roles in different parties. Um, we need to see uh, who will anchor the coalition going forward and how will others in the coalition react. Uh, we've already seen early signs of conflict from the early cabinet appointments, but this was resolved very quickly. Right? Uh, and this is partly because we're in the honeymoon period, right? Right now, uh, everything is, uh, uh, nothing is insurmountable. Uh, but the experience in other countries with coalition governments is that the real test occurs after a year or so, right? Uh, uh, some of you may remember in Sri Lanka, right, in uh, 2015, when the Rajapaksi government was. Uh, toppled totally unexpectedly as well. And now they're going up to another election, the coalition uh, with so much promise, a bit like ours here, looks like they will now lose the next election, right? Because of all the difficulties of governing as a coalition, right? The Arab Spring, all the governments that were toppled there will replace often with coalition governments made for strange bedfellows, right? Again, look at them now. Right? Look at the Middle East today. So it's not easy and it's very challenging. Uh, and I think we have to be realistic about the challenges um, and not fool ourselves that changing the government is the, already uh, the solution to all the problems. It's the start of the fight in dealing with the problem, not the end, right? And the real challenge lies ahead uh, for the coalition to work. And because of the magnitude of the problem, um, the uh, reforms that are required is going to be quite wide, uh, quite extensive, and um, this could test further the integrity of a loosely bound coalition, right? Uh, vested interests and detractors uh, will try to exploit these differences and play on sensitivities, and you can't blame them for doing that, uh, but we need to uh, withstand those things. And I'll just give you one example uh, that I came across recently of an ex-MP, uh, Taufik Ismail, uh, and this relates to the GLCs, and that's why I've chosen it. Uh, and he was quoted in uh, the Free Malaysia Today press saying, um, you know, the purge of GLC chiefs was one step too far, right? And using uh, Guan Eng uh, as a hatchet man was turning the cull into a racial issue, right? So these are the sorts of things that he's saying to the press. The only thing that's turning this into a racial issue is his statement, right? In trying to turn it into a racial issue. But these are the kind of things I think that can happen uh, going forward and will test the integrity of the coalition and need to be, they need to be prepared for this and they need to be able to overcome them uh, because this will be used. Playing the racial card is not unique to Malaysia, it's used all over the world, but it can be particularly damaging uh, unless the coalition is tightly bound. Uh, in fact, just uh, going on with that same uh, article, uh, he went on to say, uh, yes, they enjoyed their position, admittedly through patronage, 
but it would have been a competitive climb for them nevertheless. So competitive patronage apparently is okay, right? So you could have beat out other cronies to get to the top and that's still okay. Uh, and this, I think, exemplifies the magnitude of the challenge uh, we are facing when people still have this kind of view about the system. It's been around for so long that it's somehow not so bad anymore, right? Yeah. Okay, so uh, let me try and wrap up now and say that I think uh, this uh, issue of governing as a coalition uh, with uh, efficiency and being effective as a coalition will be the critical issue going forward, right? Uh, how will differences across party platforms be resolved, right? Will there be convergence or will there be compromise, right? Uh, and what extent of the converge the extent to which there will be convergence versus compromise, right? Now, with any coalition uh, with disparate interests, there will be horse trading, right, to get to a consensus of sorts. Uh, the issue here is how much will that dilute the reform process, right? And so, how much real change can be delivered? by this new government, right? That is the uh, nature of the beast, given the coalition of convenience. And uh, I think uh, there is every opportunity for them to uh, work effectively together. Um, and if they can, then real change will be possible. So with that, I think, Chandra, let me stop. Uh, and I look forward to your questions. Uh, th thank you, Jay. Uh, there's two parts uh, to Jay's talk. Uh, Jay started by talking about uh, overall growth, the structural changes, and uh, more, more like an ADB, uh, more on growth, more structural reforms, and so on. The second part of his talk is even more interesting, uh, which actually builds on the micro foundation of institutions and how effective micro foundations are, including the issue of race and so on and so forth. So there are two parts, but uh, to me, they are connected uh, quite well. But I have a lot of questions. But I will let the audience ask the questions first. Yes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Erwin Tan from uh, Sunway here. My question may be a little bit divert from what uh, Dr. Jayev said. I just want to find out from Dr. Jayev's point of view, our, you have mentioned the sound of G, GLC and GLC are pretty rich. What is your view if they were to divert their investment, sell it to whoever who are willing to buy, and use the uh, proceed to reduce the debt? That's question number one. Question number two, you show the chart of the one trillion. I already get the view that uh, the number is always there, as what uh, my good friend Tan Sri mentioned the sound. What is the view that the uh, those two figures that we was actually guaranteed figure, and another figure was actually, uh, I forgot what's the technical term we use, is uh, not inside the debt. Lease payments. Uh, these are actually future debt. Yeah. So what is the view that the, for our current government to put a one trillion to frighten the, eco the, the riot? Thank you, Rob. Uh, thank you, Mr. Jayan, for your very interesting talk. <coughs> I saw the first thing which is very interesting when you talk. You talk about this uh, premature industrialization, the, the uh, industrialization. Yeah. Most countries also, when they develop, their industrialization, their industry percentage will drop, just like agriculture. But why do you say Malaysia has reached the point of premature deindustrialization? You know? I understand America also trying to go back to industrialization. You know, I, I just want to know what, at what point you say we are premature deindustrialized. Thank you. Dr. Menon, thank you very much for that very uh, economically diplomatic talk. <laughs> and thank but you, for you, you uh, in between the lines, I can see you hit on a lot of very important issues. Now, I would just like to ask one question. You have mentioned the weaknesses, the structural problems, and how they should be addressed. 
But my point is, in the end, these are really on the periphery. The basic, the heart of the problem is the economic policy today and its relevance. The elephant is in the room, but most often ignored. I would now ask whether you agree with me that whatever we do might be tinkering with a major problem. We need a structural change, an overhaul, and we should therefore adapt a new economic model which was given a lot of study, a lot of thought, rather than try and tinker with the system. Because we are, will be caught in a middle income trap because of the affirmative action gone wrong. So we need to have an income based, not a race based policy, so that everybody gains. Those in need gain most and the others can adjust. So my question is, don't you think we should come out strongly supporting the NEM rather than the NEP and its elements? Thank you. Okay, no, thank you all very much uh, for those questions. Uh, uh, starting with the first one uh, from uh, Mr. Tan. Um, what, what do I think about uh, divestment? Uh, I think, yeah, the issue of divestment, um, once we are clear about, um, you know, uh, the GLC um, uh, is the right one that requires divestment, right? And that can only happen after a very detailed study, which has never been undertaken so far, a detailed study of individual GLCs, their uh, performance uh, and their impacts. Um, and once it's determined that uh, that is indeed uh, one of the firms that is actually a drain on public resources rather than a gain uh, to public resources, then I think a carefully designed divestment program that allows the uh, citizens to invest in that firm directly rather than this idea that the government hold assets as uh, in trust or shares in trust, which is a whole GLC concept. I think that will work. And I think uh, it could be used uh, to reduce uh, the current debt, right? Um, but um, it's, um, it shouldn't, that should not be the reason to divest, though, just to reduce the debt. If it makes sense um, to divest because it's a drain on the government's resources, it's uh, inefficiently run, it's not serving a social objective, then they should divest. And an incidental benefit is that it can reduce the public uh, debt, right? And it's not just a one-off gain to public debt, right? Uh, of course, there'll be a one-off reduction uh, by the proceeds, but because it'll stop being a drain on the public uh, sector, right? Uh, if the GLC is uh, uh, inefficient, it'll be an ongoing saving for the government going forward. So I think uh, uh, basically, uh, if we uh, pick the right GLCs for divestment, it will reduce immediate debt and the future accumulation of debt. Okay, uh, so, um, but, uh, I think some, you also asked about the. I know uh, before there also the uh, this thing about debt itself, uh, about that this is future debt. All debt is future debt, right? This question is whether or not it's reconfigured debt um, to artificially appear uh, as if it's um, off balance sheet or not. Yeah. Okay. So uh, yes, pre uh, premature uh, deindustrialization. Um, most of the countries that have gone through so-called premature industrialization have gone through it due to technological disruption or um, uh, so-called globalization uh, mismanaged, right? That's the Danny Roderick uh, uh, analysis. Right, but why is it different in Malaysia? Uh, in Malaysia, I think um, the premature industrialization um, is being policy-driven or policy-induced. 
right? Uh, so, you know, uh, if you go back to Malaysia's history, right? Um, you know, uh, the colonial colonials set Malaysia up to be a very efficient exporting economy uh, in commodities, right? Uh, rubber and tin, mainly. Now, we are going back to where we started, to commodities again, but just processing them a little bit more, right? And the commodities themselves have changed from rubber and tin to petrol and oil palm, right? And it's because of the uh, policy framework, all the things that Tantri was mentioning just now, I think, that has driven this premature deindustrialization, right? Uh, investment falling off, capital flight, uh, brain drain, right? All the things uh, as a result of the distorted policy environment in this country uh, that has produced premature deindustrialization. Not the exogenous shocks that usually uh, cause it, like technology disruption or uh, you know, uh, trade-related uh, uh, issues, right? This is homegrown, home-induced, premature deindustrialization. Yeah, which brings me nicely, I think, to your point, right? I fully agree, right? And um, uh, I have to be a bit diplomatic, uh, since even if I say this is a personal view, I'm still here while working at ADB. But I fully agree, the time has come right, uh, for um, this government to reconsider the whole policy framework, right? The new economic model, I remember when it first came out, being very uh, excited reading it and thinking this is, you know, uh, a remarkable um, sort of um, uh, achievement by this government. Will they be able to implement it, right? I guess they never really did. Um, and now uh, we need uh, NEM Mark II, I guess, revisiting that model uh, and trying again to deal with um, the kind of uh, failings uh, that the system has produced, right? And like I said, it's not that um, uh, we, uh, the, it, it, we're getting to a point where the current system is unsustainable, right? All the indicators are there, the growing debt, growing unemployment, growing wealth inequality, they're all there, suggesting that the system will break if we don't do something about it. So hopefully this will happen, and I cannot but agree that it's time for a, you know, a policy, a full policy uh, review that creates a new type of incentive framework. Uh, as a chairman, uh, I will ask uh, a few questions. Uh, uh, one important point is uh, some salacious facts uh, we already have. There's already a new government, there's a coalition, a uh, very fragile coalition as highly pointed out by you. And your talk started by talking about structural adjustment, structural costs, and so on. And the reforms you suggested is going to uh, create deeper structural reform which means that uh, ADB has forecasted 6.5% growth for Malaysia, I think, around for this year, and next year it's uh, going to be close to that, 6%. How deep do you think the structural reform is going to be? The deeper the structural reform, you're going to shave off quite a bit of growth. In fact, I would suggest maybe 1% or 2% is going to go away. And it's going to create, again, you discuss about unemployment, and it's going to create a lot of unemployment, which all these, all these things will fit into the weak coalition we already have, which means that we might only have a one-term party if they don't generate the growth. So how they're going to manage the structural adjustment, the costs, and how they're going to manage the growth is going to be very interesting to see the trade-off. Uh, that's the first question. Sorry, can I ask the chairman a question? Yes. Just to clarify your position. Yes. Are you saying why the structural reform is going to create more unemployment than growth? Is that what you're saying? That's a question okay. I'm, I'm posing to him. I don't understand that. Yeah. Because uh, if you're going to cut off all the GLCs and, 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 and you're going to de-invest and so on and so forth, given the fragility that uh, Jay already mentioned from the beginning, we might become more fragile. 
And that means every structure adjustment that's a cause. Actually, that's what uh, highlighted by Jay. So what is the cause and what is the benefit? So there will be some impact on growth, which the question is how deep the impact on growth for Jay. The second point is on human capital. I think human capital is the most fundamental component that needs to drive this growth, which leads into premature DCD industrialization. So Jay mentioned about some weakness in our educational system and so on. But he completely ignored that because that reflects the net exporter of human capital. The only country in ASEAN who's a net exporter of skills is Philippines. They ex export a lot of skills outside. So that is not a good sign. Countries like Malaysia should be an importer of skills. That, that should be the key driver of growth itself. Again, uh, these are two questions, how to change that? What is the fundamental reform you need in our educational system to create empowering young people to actually be part of this growth? That should be very fundamental in our, in our, in our plan, which goes to the, the economic model. So, uh, yeah, thank you, Shanre, for giving me two easy questions, yeah? <laughs> uh, I think, yeah, there are uh, some aspects of the reform program that will reduce, uh, that could have a downward impact on immediate growth. I think that's true. Uh, you know, things like uh, cancelling or delaying or uh, mega projects um, will have a negative impact on uh, current growth, but will reduce the burden on future generations, right? Especially when the uh, mega project is uh, financially uh, questionable, right? Yeah. The East Coal Rail Link, I think, is clearly ridiculously unviable to anyone who knows anything about transport. I mean, to expect um, uh, freight to be unloaded in Kuantan to be transported by rail at a high cost to Klang to be reloaded onto another ship is madness, right? It just doesn't make any sense. Freight is a fraction of the cost of any kind of land transport, right? So uh, this is clearly an unviable project. I think the uh, high-speed rail link also uh, may not be viable. The high-speed uh, rail links that are viable uh, have high densities of population and high, very high incomes. Right, but anyway, um, yeah. So those sorts of things will uh, reduce current growth, but um, uh, at, but reduce future obligations, uh, future, uh, the obligation of future generations, uh, and therefore uh, debt. Um, now this uh, will cause problems for the reform agenda. Right, it's easier to bring in reforms when times are good. Yeah, when you have growth, yes, that's right. So you can absorb the people who are displaced uh, through structural adjustment into new growing sectors of the economy, right? But I think a couple of things uh, can offset this at the moment. Uh, this government actually is likely to run, to increase the deficit, right? The annual deficit. Um, this is because the, it has already repealed the GST, which was about 20% of uh, revenue. Uh, the, the sales tax that will replace it will not earn anywhere near that amount, right? So that's a fiscal injection already by cutting taxes. And also it has promised um, quite a bit of uh, social sp uh, spending in social sectors, right? Um, so this will all boost... Um, uh, 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 boost spending and growth. This will have a positive impact on growth. Uh, it might add to that to some extent, but then uh, oil prices are now rising again. So this might uh, offset some of the impact on debt, uh, but we shouldn't really rely on oil prices to do it. Uh, but uh, right now, this is a, a net uh, injection, injection government to the economy in terms of its spending versus uh, taxing, right? So it'd be an overall net increase as an injection to 
the economy and growth, and that will offset some of the other factors that are slowing down growth in the structural reforms, I think, yeah. Uh, now, on the human capital, I uh, fully agree with you. I think this is the real uh, challenge facing um, Malaysia in the long run, right? Um, um, uh, Philippines is a net exporter of skills, but so is Malaysia, right? Skills-wise, right? We import low-skilled labor, but we lose uh, higher skilled workers, right? Uh, and the biggest beneficiary is Singapore, yeah. your country, yeah? <laughs> yeah, just uh, point that out. Yeah, it's always interesting to point out the Singaporeans in the Malaysian lecture. Yeah, but uh, um, yeah, so that's um, uh, one uh, clear uh, problem is to stop the brain drain, right? And if they get it right, uh, we can see that there's a possibility of a brain gain, right? And the best example, of course, is India, right? When um, we had the reforming uh, government, not the current one, but the <laughs> previous uh, few, uh, there were a lot of uh, returning Indians from overseas, from England, etc., that were quite successful, that came home again, right, to try and... Um, you know, be successful. It wasn't just patriotism, but they also felt it was a good business opportunity. And this could happen in Malaysia too, right? Which will then, again, improve um, conditions um, uh, and, um, you know, uh, be another unexpected payoff from reforming the uh, uh, race-based uh, affirmative action program that drove them away many of them uh, to begin with. And there could be capital flight returning as well, right? Uh, all of these things, if we get this right. But um, the uh, I'm not an education expert, that's why I did not uh, get into it, uh, but I know that it is a critical factor, right? And it's also one that is um, uh, self-reinforcing, right? Uh, and what I mean by that is um, when you have... Um, uh, deteriorating education system, then this compounds in a negative direction uh, generation after generation, right? So if the education system is underfunded or distorted, it produces weaker teachers for the next generation of students. And this compounds in the same way that if it's improving, it can escalate and improve in a compounding fashion too. And we can see that in Vietnam and Cambodia, for instance, right? Where both directions are possible. Uh, and this is why it's very important now to stem the slide uh, and reverse this trend. Uh, but I don't know exactly how. Uh, there might be education experts here who can tell us a bit more about this. Uh, I'll go ahead first. Yeah. Uh, my name is Chai, I'm from University Putra, Malaysia. My first question would actually be, uh, Dr. Mino, what are your opinions about the impact of population aging, especially on old age employment and older workers, considering our social protection system? My second question, I would like to apologize in advance. Um, the anthropologist uh, David Greber actually mentioned about the increasing number of bullshit jobs. and. Uh, while the gig economy might sound uh, nasi lemak sellers or grab car drivers, they are performing an actual service or a uh, function. But we have an increasing number of uh, middle management, and my apologies to stockbrokers and corporate lawyers, that uh, where we are just pushing papers around. And as an economist, you know that those some activities, while might look that a lot of money have changed hands, it is not really generating any product or services of value. So. Uh, in conjunction to your idea and your observation about uh, what we call premature uh, the uh, industrialization are you seeing that the services sector the growth in the services sector is it a coincidence that we have so many glcs and so many middle management and so many ceos and uh, working in areas that don't really actually contribute actual product and value but it can actually somehow generate monetary uh, uh, impact on the, the GDP. Thank you. I, I want to ask about yen loan. I read about JICA and ODA. So will austerity from Malaysia be a precondition for yen loan? 
Thank you, Dr. Jayan. Thank you. Um, yes, I think population aging is a very uh, important issue. Yes, that's right. Uh, in fact, not just in Malaysia, but um, in this region, right? Yeah, we've got you know countries like Thailand, uh, Japan, Korea, China. Uh, major aging societies they're going to pose huge challenges on the public sector for care uh, and uh, yeah okay the various things that um, you know uh, can be done I think because of the fourth industrial revolution to help in sort of dealing with these problems but also I think uh, you know being open to labor flows is one way of actually uh, ensuring that this impact is minimized letting young skilled people come in and uh, so on and uh, to deal with the shrinking labor force right um, on your point about the so-called bullshit jobs yeah uh, that's a difficult one. I think there's a, there is a lot of this uh, slack in uh, both private and public firms, more so I think in the GLCs than in private firms because you know the kind of uh, the kind of um, uh, disciplines are different, right? They can survive despite being unprofitable, unlike private firms, and they're not uh, subject to the same kind of constraints, right? It's just like you know people uh, think corruption is not just confined to GLCs, a lot of corruption in the private sector, but uh, private firms are not trustees of public funds, right? Yeah, that's a key difference. Now, in terms of uh, yen loans, JICA and ODA, um, I think, uh, you know, uh, uh, Malaysia technically has graduated from borrowing from um, the multilateral agencies, but they can still, uh, you know, borrow from bilateral agencies and I think uh, Japan uh, has been a long time uh, sort of investor and lender to Malaysia a lot of the infrastructure we see being built here is going that way and um, I put this bit delicately this switch I think with this government from China to Japan may play out in a way that favors uh, Japanese lending austerity is not that important anymore for a country with a decent credit rating like Malaysia. So that shouldn't matter too much, I think. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Uh, with that, um, let me do a, one or two uh, comments. Uh, I know Jay for many, many years, and Jay has... You don't have to respond, right? No, no, no. <laughs> uh, Jay has uh, spoken about Malaysia quite a bit, outside of Malaysia. And uh, the first time uh, he's talking about this for me here, itself it reflects the change that's coming to Malaysia. The, the, he talked about uh, brain uh, drain. In fact, uh, what he presented is actually a brain gain for, our, for us. So there is already a reversal to discuss these issues in such a deep level from an academic and ADB person coming here and talking very freely. That itself shows a lot of change that's already occurring in Malaysia, which is in the right direction. The issue is to keep that momentum and keep that uh, reform agenda moving. I think that is what Jay has been trying to say. With that, uh, let's thank Jay for being very open and honest. Thank you. Thank you.